Hare Krishna devotees, please accept my humble obeisance also the all Gracious Shri Prabhupada. Welcome to devotees to today's Srimad Bhagavatam class. This morning we are going to be discussing from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 2, Chapter 1, Verse 33. And the chapter is entitled The First Steps to God Realization. We're very happy to have His Holiness Chandramali Swami with us, who is right in America with us. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to you and Shri Prabhupada Maharaj. Hare Krishna, Jai Ho, Anusuya, my obeisances to you and all of the wonderful devotees that you brought with you. Well, you brought with you, Maharaj. I'm just the background, just moving buttons. That's all I'm doing. <laughs> You're in the back, pushing them all forward. <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj, and it's all yours. <laughs> <laughs> Jai Ho, Om Namo. Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Nadyo Sadyo Nadyo Tatani Ruhani Mahiru Havishwatano Nipendra. Anantavirya Swasitam Matarisva Katir Vaya. Karma Guna Pavaha. Translation O King, the rivers are the veins of the gigantic body, the trees are the hairs on his body, and his omnipotent air is his breath. Passing ages are his movements, and his activities are the reactions of the three modes of material nature. Mm -hmm. The personality of Godhead is not a dead stone, nor is he inactive, as is poorly thought by some schools. He moves with the progress of time, and therefore he knows all about the past and future, along with his present activities. There is nothing unknown to him Conditioned souls are driven by the reactions of the modes of material nature, which are the activities of the Lord. As stated in Bhagavad Gita 7.12, the modes of nature are under his direction only, and as such, no natural functions are blind or automatic. <clears throat> the power behind the activities is the supervision of the Lord, and thus the Lord is never inactive as is wrongly conceived. The Vedas say that the Supreme Lord has nothing to do personally, as is always the case with superiors. But everything is done by his direction. As it is said, not a blade of grass moves without his sanction. In the Brahma Samhita 5.48, it is said that all the universes are the heads of them, the Brahmas, exist only for duration of his breathing period. The same is confirmed here. The air on which the universes and planets within the universe exist is nothing but the breath, a bit of the breath of the unchallengeable Virat Purush. So even by studying the rivers, trees, airs, and passing ages, one can conceive of the personality of Godhead without being misled by the formless conception of the Lord. In the Bhagavad Gita 12.5, it is said that those who are much inclined to the formless conception of the supreme truth are more troubled than those who are intelligently conceived of the person form. Omagyan. Timidandasya Gyananjana Salakaya Chaksun Militam Yenatas Mai Shri Gurave Namaha Namaum Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Mahti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pacharine Nirvasesa Sinyavadi Pasyatya De Sitarine Manchakalpa Taru Bischa Kripa Sindhu Evacha Titanam Bhavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namaha Namaha 
जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु नित्यानंद श्री अद्वैत गदाधार श्री वासुदी गौर भक्त वृंदम हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे सो हियर यूर हियरिंग अ डिस्क्रिप्शन ऑफ द universal form of the lord which in one sense is formless and that it doesn't directly connect one with his transcendental original form ishwara parama krishna sat chit ananda vigraha anadir adir govinda sarva karna karna behind the formless there is the form or you might say along with the formless there is form because the word formless has no meaning unless there is form so his form is actually his transcendental personality but he manifests himself in his formless aspect also for those who cannot worship him in his transcendental form or don't want to worship him in in his transcendental form they find it more natural or easier to perceive god within nature sometimes this is called pantheism that god is nature or god is within nature and that is also true but it doesn't mean that god is nature it means that the, the nature or the energy of god is simply an expansion of one of his energies which is the formless aspect of himself which comes from his original form as he says in the bhagavad gita aham sarvasya prabhavo matat sarvam prapartam tam viti bhutav majante mam bhura bhave samandita that all of existence both form and formless are actually coming from him the original transcendental source of both the form and the formless but the devotees they worship the lord in his personal form they chant the holy name of the lord which is a formal form aspect of the lord the hari krishna maha mantra is not formless it's form because it entered it is not different than krishna in the sense that the manifestation of the transcendental sound is sabda brahman or pure of spiritual energy and it manifests itself in the form of sound sound is one of the energies of the lord and but it's not a formless aspect because within sound there is form <laughs> and that's been also shown too just like radio waves the whole scientific uh, analysis of radio waves is to project form through ether and manifest itself in various types of electronic media and you can see form through the formless media that transforms or transfers the form from one area to the other but sometimes it appears to be formless but it's not but the hari krishna maha mantra is transcendental sound in form but then the hari krishna maha mantra or the transcendental name of the lord is also manifested in the formless aspect of himself and that is called omkar om o m k a r a or om a u m that is the formless aspect of the transcendental sound vibration of the lord so those who chant omkara they are worshiping the lord in his formless manifestation of sound and those who chant hari krishna are worshiping the lord in his form aspect of sound which is the topmost and the and the way that um relationships are actually played out because in form you can't have relationships with something that is formless because by nature we are also 
formally manifested. We also have form, both spiritual and material form. We, we know what our material form is. It's this body. But our spiritual form is our soul, which is in one in the same sense as God. It is non-different than God. And God has form. And so spirit also has form in the transcendental relationship with the Lord as the Jiva soul. So here, this description of the universal form in an analogous way, showing the various aspects of the universe in connection to the a formless manifestation of the Lord's body, which is one sense imaginary, but it's why is it given so much time and energy and preference here in Srimad Bhagavatam, which is non-different than the transcendental personality of Godhead? Because people who are inclined to spirituality but have no one but cannot approach the absolute truth in the formless way can see or at least perceive the Lord in his formless manifestation as the Virat Rup. Here in the analogous, if you go down the page, it says here, well, actually it's here in the translation, the veins, the trees, and the, the trees are the hairs on his body, the omnipotent air is his breath, the rivers are his veins. Of course, you go to other verses, it says the mountains are his bones, and the uh, Oceans are his abdomen. So all this is leading ultimately to give an understanding that you can see or at least worship God through the manifestation of his energy, which in one sense is him himself. But it's preliminary. It doesn't go beyond a certain level of understanding. At least it allows one to understand that whatever is in existence is, in one sense, different or non-different and with, with the Supreme Lord himself. It's different because it's not him in his transcendental form, but it's non-different because it's one of his manifested energies known as material energy or material nature. It's called Bahiranga Shakti. And there is Antaranga Shakti, which is the pure form, formful spiritual energy. And then there's the Bahiranga Shakti, which is the material energy, which is also spiritual because it's coming from the, the uh, pure spiritual personality, Krishna himself. Therefore, anything that comes from God has to be spiritual, although it may manifest and be described in a less direct way. And that is the formless aspect of the Lord. Now, Prabhupada goes on to say that there are a class of people, and a very large class of people, you might even say, in terms of comparison, more people are inclined to worship God or to understand God or try to understand God in his formless aspect. Because in the formless aspects, there's no real commitment to surrender. <laughs> And this is, the, this is the major point. To the form aspect, in order to develop relationships with Krishna in his personal personal, there is an element of surrender that has to be there. Not an element. I mean, the feature of that relationship is based on uh, following the directions of the Supreme Lord as one's uh, guide in worshiping the Lord. Whereas the formless they don't follow so many rules and regulations or what we say guidelines. They see God within or try to see God as a manifestation of his different energies. Like that. There is a sense of awe. There's a sense of reverence that develops. And awe and reverence is actually the beginning of God worship or the worship of the Supreme Lord. Because without that principle then one cannot really progress beyond because one has to ex understand that God is the all-powerful feature of existence and he manifests himself in 
in the terms of the creative aspect of material energy. And uh, therefore, it is preliminary, as it says here, uh, this chapter is described as the first step in God realizations. And it sets the stage for people who cannot or are, are una, uh, unable to worship or even understand the nature of personality. Because the philosophy of those who worship in the formalists is that when you take form, you limit. And formlessness is unlimited and form is limited. It's like the air. Air is everywhere. So you might say it's unlimited in one sense, that it's all pervading. But you might say a person who breathes air is limited. They're in one place, and that's all. But that's a material conception. And it doesn't apply to the absolute nature of God because in the formless or in the form, the formless also exists. And the form is superior to the form, formless because formlessness is an energy of the form. And therefore, in the form, uh, there is no limitation. Everything exists within the form, just like we say, when we chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, the first stage of realize, realizing Krishna through his chant name in the process of chanting is to realize that Krishna and his name is non-different. That is the first stage of realization through the process of chanting Hare Krishna. If one is practicing the process properly with the right, proper mood, then one can understand, yes, the name is non-different than Krishna. One can feel the presence of Krishna through the chanting of his name. As that manifests more, then one can understand and experience God in his form as, the, as a, you might say, the manifestation of the next step in realization of the chanting. So from the name comes the form, and then the third step is qualities, and the last step is his pastimes or activities. So in within the name, because it is non-different than the personality of Godhead, his forms are there, his qualities are there, his attributes, his paraphernalia, the dom, everything and ultimately ending and culminating with the highest aspects of realization of the name, that the name actually takes one into the association of Krishna to be paid, to, to take part in Krishna's transcendental pastimes, even while one is in this material world, because that's a very complete and high level of pure devotion. And you we see from the examples of the Goswamis, such as Rupa Goswami, Raghunath Das Goswami. Raghunath Das Goswami uh, would go into his uh, manifestation as his Siddha day, his spiritual body. He'd be chanting the holy name of the Lord and all of a sudden he'd leave that level of consciousness and enter into the pastimes as his uh, personal identity as Rati Manjari. And then in that mood of Matari uh, Rati Manjari, he would be serving Srimati Radharani in her personal abode and doing all personal things to uh, prepare her to meet with Lord Krishna in their transcendental pastimes. And then after some time, he would leave that realm and go back to uh, Raghunath Das Goswami, the great sage, chanting on the banks of the holy river. And then as he would go again deeper into the holy name, he would leave that realm and go back into his uh, realm of being with uh, Radharani in the spiritual world. And so you can see this is this course, this is the highest uh, expression of one's bhakti one enters into the pastimes of the Lord. But the point is that within the name, 
everything exists. Therefore, within the form, formlessness exists and all of the manifestations of the quality of the form of the Lord also manifest, such as his attributes, pastimes, qualities, of Dom, everything is there. So therefore, chanting of the holy name of the Lord is the recommended way to achieve perfect self-realization in this age and reach the highest form of transcendental realization. That is, one's eternal relationship with Krishna in the spiritual world. And that's mentioned by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in the first verse of Shik Shastri Kapoor Pair, um, where he says, Chaito Dharmana Marjanam Baba Mahadevani Nirvapanam Shreya Kriva Vichandrika Vitanam Vidya Vidhi Jivanam Anandam Bhuri Vardanam Prati Pratam Purnam Rita Swadanam. That is the point there, that particular quality of the chanting of the Nam Prati Pradam Purnam Amrita Swan, that every step. As one makes progress in chanting, one becomes more and more connected to their personal uh, form with Krishna in the spiritual world. So everything is there in the chanting of the Holy Name. And the Mayavadis and others, they also chant, but they chant Om. And the Om is the, the, the impersonal manifestation of God. It's one sense non-different than Hare Krishna, but it doesn't give realization of the transcendental form of the Lord, which is the nature of bhakti. Therefore, they remain, what we say, on the on the platform at best of gyan. Of gyan. They have knowledge of, uh, of, the, uh, of the unmanifested form of the Lord as the energy of the, that pervades the material energy. But then again, that's also a temporary manifestation, as is explained by um, Lord Brahma. And he says, Aruna Krishna Padam Padam Padantiyada Anadritya Usmana Ahangrayaha. This is a verse from the 14th chapter of the uh, 10th canto, where he says that, yes, there are persons. Who worship the Lord and they go high on the spiritual platform, but because they do not take up devotional service, padantiyada, again, they fall down back to the material level in due course of time. And their efforts to achieve perfection are, are ultimately very difficult to perform. Therefore, in one sense, the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra is easy in the sense that what is required to chant it requires an ear to hear the sound a tongue to make the sound and a mind to focus one's attention on that sound everyone has that but of course in kali yuga it becomes even the easiest process becomes very difficult but by the mercy of the spiritual master and Lord Chaitanya, one can realize the highest manifestation of the Supreme Lord in his personal form through the process of surrendering oneself in devotional service to the Lord. That means there must be guidance from Krishna's pure representative, the spiritual master. Otherwise, well, on one's own, they can try just like the material, the, spirit, the, uh, the Maya bodies or the impersonals. Prabhupada mentions here one verse. If you go down the page, you'll see that verse as part of this. Um, it's 12.5, yeah. In the Bhagavad Gita, it said that those who are much inclined to the formless conception are more troubled than those who are intelligently conceived of the personal form. And although they're trying for a lesser level of understanding of the world, but to get to the lesser level, it's more trouble than getting to the higher level. <laughs> so, and so this is Klesha Dictatoris Tesham of Yakta Yakta Tesham. 
This is the verse from the Bhagavad Gita 12.5, which chapter is devotional service. So Krishna explains himself both in his personal and impersonal form. But for the devotees, the personal form is the most attractive and the, the more natural way to approach the absolute truth. Because we are person and God is also person. But here, for the sake of those who cannot approach or will not approach the absolute truth in his personal form, because they don't want to surrender to the Lord. That's the, that may, that's the point. They don't want to give up their conceptions of their uh, understanding of their activities in the material world, or they want to do it their own way. <laughs> Pretty much, that's, that's they want to. They think they can approach the absolute truth through their own process of nati, 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 nati. Not this, not this, not this, not this. <laughs> but it's it's very arduous. They can come to some level of understanding that God is all pervading, and all, all the energy, everything in existence is a manifestation of of, of the supreme truth. But they can't develop what we say loving relationships with the Lord. They get sat, and sometimes those who are very expert in the formless aspect, they can also get chit, which is super soul manifestation. But they cannot approach the absolute truth in Bhagavan or the form manifestation of the Lord as the supreme source of all existence, Krishna, the personality of God. So, but this it's been the, to just to re-emphasize the importance of these particular verses here in this chapter it's for beginners for those who cannot take to the highest prop they can get a foothold in devotional service and if they stay with this and hear from the scriptures and from a bona fide representative of the Lord they can actually give up their thing just like Four Kumaras. The four Kumaras were Brahmavadis. They were sons of Lord Brahma. And they had realized God in their his formless aspect as Brahman. They were Brahman realized. But when they came in contact with the lotus feet of the Lord and smelled the beautiful Tulsi leaves and sandalwood pulp, pulp that was emanating from the Lord's transcendental lotus feet, they actually gave up automatically their conception of Brahman realization and actually took to personal devotion. And that's mentioned in the uh, third canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. So we have examples of those who, who move from the formless to the form. But it's good to know for devotees who worship the Lord in this form, what is the formless aspect? <laughs> and so we can understand the difference between the two and to help us to stay fixed in our process of devotional service. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Marsh, for making it as simple as possible for us to really understand this, the essence of this chapter and the essence of the verse. Very, very nice class, Marsh. Thank you for the points. I'm going to stop sharing and <coughs> I request devotees, if you can please, uh, wherever you're at, turn on your videos <clears throat> so that we can have each other's association and also with Maharaj. And if there are any questions, please do raise your hand. And I will call in the order. Sri Devi is on it. Sri Devi, I think you got over your jet lag, huh? <laughs> Guru Dev's mercy. <laughs> That's it's all, all yours, Mataji. Go right ahead with your question. Please accept my humble obeisances, Guru Dev. All glories to Prabhupada. All glories to your holiness. So as I was hearing your class, Guru Maharaj, about the formless aspect, which is uh, worshipped by many, I was also remembering that Prabhupada said even the Mayavadis, uh, they chant Hare Krishna, but they chant Hare Krishna with the intention to become one with uh, Radha Krishna. So 
if they are chanting with the wrong intention rather than in a devotional mood, but because the holy name is supremely pure, will they get some benefit from that chanting? Yeah, they get freedom from material suffering. It's called, what is it called? Book, bukti, bukti karma, or that kind of result that is freedom from material uh, suffering. They rise above the material energy and they enter into the consciousness of being spirit. But they see the holy name not as the, as the Lord, but as a means to an end rather than the end in itself. <laughs> So in one sense, the Maya, there's a two, there's a difference between the impersonalists and the Mayavadis. Impersonalists worship the Supreme Lord as the Brahman of Fulgens, the, the Gyanis. But many Gyanis are also Mayavadis in the sense that they believe that ultimately um, all of the different forms are meant as a manifestation to reach the formless. And there, in one sense, they are apparatus, they're offenders. So they offend the Lord by thinking that the Lord is, uh, they actually think that they are God themselves. And also that they can simply worship the deity, chant the names, perform various sacrifices, penances, austerities, and pujas then they can come to the platform of being the Supreme Lord. And they call themselves Narayan, Om Namo. They, they address each other as Om Namo Narayan. Like that. Mayavadis are offenders. The impersonalists, who are not Mayavadis, who are worshipping the Brahman aspect, are not offenders. And therefore, they can progress to the second and ultimately third stage if they follow the process properly. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Thank you for the nice question, Sri Devi. Any questions from devotees, please do raise your hand or you can put it in the chat and I will be happy to read your question. Maharaj, um, was, as you were speaking about um, uh, the formless being unlimited and the form, versus, which is the personal form of Krishna being limited, I was just thinking that, um, for you know, like I, I was just thinking like in a practical sense, like when it comes to, you know, a mother and child relationship or parent and child relationship, there is a form for the parent to look up to the parent, you know, because there is a mom and a dad kind of a form, as opposed to a child thinking that everybody is parent and it's limitless. So I'm just thinking, what makes one think that, you know, what makes one thing that that the personal form of Krishna is limited? I'm, I'm just trying to think more in a they, they compare they compare material with spiritual their understanding is the material form and therefore they they superimpose the idea on the spiritual that form is limited therefore even uh, God's form is also material because it's limited but it's not Krishna's form is transcendental and it's the embodiment of all manifestations of the absolute truth within. And it manifests himself in different ways according to how one worships the Lord. So, so spiritual form is not limited, but material form is limited. So, yeah. Just like people imitate Krishna's rasa dance, thinking that they are actually, you know, performing a spiritual activity. But it's not, because Krishna's rasa dance is in a completely different consciousness and a different realization level. It's not like people who are trying to enjoy boy and girl in this world and performing activities to experience something. It's not. It's 
is completely opposite. But it looks the same. <clears throat> Therefore, unless they, they take shelter of the pure representative of, this, of the Lord, the spiritual master, they cannot understand the Lord's activities. <clears throat> they compare the Lord with themselves or with something material. And the most popular uh, misconception is that when Krishna comes to the material world, he takes on a material form. Just like you might see that his form looks material and may even seem to act in that way. Just like when Lord Nityananda was hit in the head with the pot by Madai, his head started to bleed. You might say, well, that's material. But that's your vision, that's all. The Lord doesn't try to perform miracles in the material world to convince people that he is the Supreme Lord. He comes to purify the atmosphere and to gather devotees to uh, worship him and help them move forward on the process of devotional service. So he may manifest something that looks material, but it's not. It's just not. It's transcendental. Just like we say, well, they say, well, you know, uh, Krishna danced with so many gopis, I can do that. Then, all right. I mean, you want to <laughs> you want to dance with gopis? Then go ahead and go ahead and lift over down hell. If you actually think you you're as good as the supreme, you can do the same thing. Then lift the over down hill. Let's see if you can do that. They can't. Or those who worship Shiva, they say, well, you know, Shiva, you know, he smokes ganja. All right. Um, so we can smoke ganja because he's our, you know, our worship of deity and we're following him. All right. Then drink an ocean of poison. As he did during the, uh, the manifestation of the, uh, what is that, Leela? Uh, in the 15th chapter. It's the king of all Leelas in the Bhagavatam, aside from Krishna's personal Leelas. Samudra Mantan Leela? What is that? Samudra Mantan Leela? No, it has a different name. Churning of the ocean. Is that the churning of the ocean, Maharaj, that pastime? Yeah, yeah. With, with uh, Mohini Murti coming at the end? Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. But it's Mantan. Yeah, it's it's the well, I guess you could say the turning of the ocean. It has another name though. So it's called either Amrit Manthan or Samudra Manthan Leela. Okay. I can accept that because I don't really know the other name. <laughs> so the point is that we you can't imitate grace personalities and think that you you know it's all right to do whatever they do. Tejo Sam Rajo Sire, the scriptures say, you know, they can do these things because they're transcendental to material energy. But then again, they may act ordinary also for the sake of teaching others how to perform, you know, spiritual activities. The imitation is cheap. An imitation is doesn't have any basis in 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 reality. This is what it is: imitation. So yeah, if you want to, you know, be like God, then then you know, do the same thing He does. <laughs> Let's see if you can do it. They can't do it, but yet they still claim that they're the supreme. That's the Maharaj. <clears throat> so, so Maharaj, thank you, Maharaj, for that uh, clarification. Thank you so much. Maharaj, so if if my understanding is correct, is the, the chapter is entitled First Steps, which you mentioned it's the, it's, it's the you know, <laughs> preliminary steps to, to Krishna consciousness. So here, Sri Prabhupada is explaining uh, you know, the different forms that one can appreciate the Lord. 
hoping that they will get to the stage of the personal form of God. Is that what it is, Maharaj? Yeah, <laughs> it's a step by step um, process to come to the come out of the materialistic concept and come into the first step is to be able to see God in nature. It's it's it's, it's just very basic preliminary. <laughs> As for as for people who are materially inclined, but still have some interest in the spiritual aspect of existence, sometimes we call it pantheism. That's one way of seeing it. But pantheism says that God is nature. Where we say that to see God in nature is an element of pantheism, but it's not actual the same understanding as pantheism. They say God is nature. They say God can be seen in nature because that nature is also an energy of him. He comes, he manifests himself in his different energies, and nature is one of them. And to give a little form to that understanding, the analogy of his transcendental body, the, the rivers, bones, veins, like that, these are the connecting forces that make it more personal. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's a preliminary stage. It's not for devotees. <laughs> devotees are beyond that. They have gotten beyond that. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> March, when you were mentioning uh, these two points, I, I really had to, you know, play with the vocab in my mind because God as nature is formless, but seeing God in nature with this energy is a personal aspect of the Lord's energy. Right. Yeah. Just like people say, well, why do you worship a stone as God? It's like we worship Shaligar. Why do you worship stone as God? We don't worship stone as God. We worship God who comes in the form of stone. It's the opposite. Thank you, Marge. Very deep. Very deep. Thank you. Any questions from devotees, please do raise your hand. This is a very, yes, Prickshit, go ahead. I guess the matter has been accepted on the basis since all goes to your Prabhupada. So it's the question started, uh, Sri Devi um, mentioned some things, and Sri mentioned some things. So I'm trying to connect the dots, and um, you tell me if I'm reasoning correctly. This is the reason now I'm speaking out now. Um, I heard the Mayavadi chant the Hare Krishna mantra, and then you also said that they are offensive. Mm -hmm. And so then I started thinking, well, they must know the meaning of the Hare Krishna Mata, because the meaning says that please engage me in his service. So they're supposed to be servants according to the mantra that they chant, if they chant the Hare Krishna Mata. But at the same time, they want to come up to the master level of, of being Narayan. And that's where the offense is. Is that? They see the Hare Krishna Mantra is material. It's a mean, ah. means to the spiritual. That's all. Okay. It's a way to get to the spiritual. That's all. It's like if you want to go to the top of the roof, you need a ladder. <laughs> so the ladder, yeah. so for them, they, they worship the deity of the Lord. They also have deities. They also, they chant mantras, not only the Hare Krishna mantras, but other mantras, as a means to purify themselves to get to the point of realization. It's more like, just like we follow rules and regulations. Rules and regulations are material, but they're necessary in order to get towards the spiritual. If we don't follow rules and regulations, then we can't really go beyond a certain point of understanding because these rules and regulations allow us to stay on the path 
to move in the right direction. But ultimately, they're not the goal. Sometimes we see that in Krishna consciousness. Devotees get so attached to rules and regulations, but they don't know what the purpose of the rules and regulations are. It's to go to the point of realization of the absolute truth. Mm. So we, uh, we, we accept the external as the goal, and that's the same way they do. But they also say that the goal is to understand you're actually God. <laughs> then when they get to the goal, whatever the imagine their goal is, then they would stop chanting the Hare the Mantra then, because then it becomes meaningless. And then they go into some kind of meditation on the formless aspect. That's like that verse that was mm -hmm. mentioned, 12.5, is they can get there, but it's very troublesome. Mm -hmm. Very troublesome. If you go, if you go to that verse, uh, honestly, at twelve point five in Bhagavad Gita, right, Maharaj? Klesha, klesha, diktataras tesham abhyakta vantesham. Abhyakta hitatiram. Papa just share it now, Maharaj. Indicates it, but it's mentioned in the chapter as devotional service. Klesha dikta taras tesham avyakta sakta chaitasam avyakta hi gatir dukam deva vabir avyapyateni. For those whose minds are attached to the unmanifested, impersonal feature of the Lord, advancement is very troublesome. This is the point. To make progress in that discipline is always difficult for those who are embodied. So, mm. Yeah, so if you read this particular purport, you'll see, you'll understand everything that we've been discussing here. Mm. It's a very, you want to read the purport or do you want to go on? I can read mm -hmm. the purport, Maharaj. Okay. <laughs> the group of transcendentalists who follow the path of the inconceivable, unmanifested, impersonal feature of the supreme lord are called jnana yogis and persons who are full who are in full krishna consciousness engaged in devotional service to the lord are called bhakti yogis now here the difference between jnana yoga and bhakti yoga is definitely expressed the process of jnana yoga although ultimately bringing one to the same goal is very troublesome Whereas the path of bhakti yoga, the process of being in direct service to the, the, to the Supreme Personality of Godhead is easier and is natural for the embodied soul. The okay. individual soul is embodied since time immemorial. It is very difficult for him to simply theoretically understand that he is not the body. Therefore, the bhakti yogi accepts the deity of Krishna as worshipable because there is some bodily conception fixed in the mind which can thus be applied of course worship of the supreme personality of god in his form within the temple is not idol worship there is evidence in the vedic literature that worship may be saguna or nirguna of the supreme possessing or not possessing attributes worship of the deity in the temple is saguna worship for the Lord is represented by material qualities, but the form of the Lord, though represented by material qualities, such as stone, wood, or oil paint, is not actually material. That is the absolute nature of the Supreme Lord. Yeah, we can stop there. And it's in the first, just further explanation of the same points. <clears throat> it's clear. Yeah, so they worship the deity thinking it's you know um to go beyond ultimately but devotees worship the deity knowing the deity is no different than the lord although he may appear in different he appears in eight different manifestations stone wood paint uh brass whatever there's and another manifestation as the lord appears within the mind also that's one of the forms of the 
of worshiping the Lord when he appears in the mind. So this gives you a little understanding of the difference between jnana yoga and bhakti yoga. And the goal of jnana yoga is Brahman realization. The goal of bhakti yoga is uh, real realizing Krishna as the ultimate principle of devotion and developing a loving relationship, which is the perfection of life, because that understanding can only satisfy the soul. Soul cannot be understood worshiping the Lord in his manifestations as Brahman or even Paramatma. Because we are also personal. <laughs> Therefore, we have a personal relationship with the personality of Godhead, and that is called bhakti, or love and devotion. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you. This is a very powerful verse too, 12.5. Very, yeah. very powerful. Yeah. Thank you, Marj. Marj, that's a question here by Rishabhadas. Um, Hare Krishna, dear Guru Gurudev and Vaishnavas, please accept my humble obeisances, all glory to Prabhupada and Gurudev. When performing Harinam Sankirtan in the street, it is preferable and wanted that a devotee uh, who who was the taste and full faith in the holy name to lead Kirtan in full Vaishnava dress with Tilak, then any Bhakta Joe who can sing nicely or who want to engage him so he feels valued, would like to hear your comment on this. Has thank you. So let me read that again, Maharaj. Um, yeah, when performing Harinam Sankirtan in the street, it is preferable and wanted that a devotee who has the taste and full faith in the holy name to lead the kirtan in full Vaishnava dress with Tilak. Then any Bhakta Joe who can sing nicely or who want who we want to engage him so he feels valued. And he's asking for a comment on that. I'm hoping I'm understanding his point here. It seems to me that if you put it in a question form, it makes more sense. Is it preferable? It's really, really, yeah, yeah. It's hitting me. Is it preferable that a person who is dressed up with a tilak and everything leave the kirtan rather than somebody in your back to do whatever they're wearing? To yeah, do it? It may be. That's the question. Okay. Yeah, you just changed it. Singing nicely is not... Uh... It's never in the scriptures as saying the quality of the, of advancement. It doesn't say because you sing nice, you're advanced. <laughs> it's those who have the devotion. Devotion is the quality of understanding, the quality of the person's spiritual position. So using the example of Sankirtan, uh, we're not street merchants or what they call it what do they go those guys that sing in the street <laughs> street singers or I don't know what are they call them we're not buskers, just buskers Mars huh? what's the word the buskers yeah something like they that they busk yeah Sorry, but... <laughs> we're not out there just to you know make a show we're out there to in inspire people to hear the glories of the Lord in the form of chanting. And we're representing the Lord by our dress. Because anybody can get out there in ordinary clothes and sing. It doesn't mean they're representing the Lord. They may also sing the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, but they're not devotees because they're doing it for some, some, I don't know, entertainment, you might say, or some uh, personal gratification. So, yeah, we, therefore, the quality is those who are following. That's the point. Those who are following are qualified to be, take the part of inspiring others. And those who are not following, they just have to learn how to follow. That's it.
Marge, that's a follow-up uh, question or point statement by Vishabhadas Prabhu. Devotees are very hesitant to be in Vaishnava clothes while in Harinam. Yeah, I have to agree with him on that. I've seen that too, sadly. Yeah, well, what is that hesitation that they don't really understand what they're doing? They're representing the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And therefore, our dress is the indication of who we are. The police, if you want to find a policeman, he, he's dressed in a certain way. If he's a plain clothes policeman, he has another mission out there. So yeah. So we're we're proud we're proud to become devotees and our dress indicates that. There was that story where uh Prabhupada talks about there was one factory with many workers in the factory. They were all Hindus. And they would come to work every day with Gopi Chandan, Tilak. And that was their, you know, part of their dress was the Tilak. So then the, the uh, factory was sold to an Islamic person. And once he took over, he said, you do not come to work anymore with this Tilak. If you do, you're, you will lose your job. So everybody stopped except one person. And then that Islamic man approached that person. He said, oh, I, I told you. I said, you can't come. Therefore, and then the man said, this is my religion. I'm proud of him. This is the way I dress. And he, by saying that, the Islamic person understood. And he said, yes, okay. Well, you can come and the rest cannot come. <laughs> Prabhupada tells that story. So the indication is, why should we be ashamed of who we are? <laughs> what are we trying to prove by, by presenting something? I mean, sometimes in certain cases, it may be also uh, advantageous to our preaching to go out with what we say ordinary clothes in certain venues for preaching. That's mentioned in the seventh canto also. When in the pastime of uh, Prahlad Maharaj, when uh, um, Harani Kashipu was saying, well, there must be Vaishnavas in disguise coming into the school and polluting Prahlad. So Prabhupada says, yes, yeah, sometimes the Vaishnavas have to come in disguise. <laughs> so we may sometimes change our dress in certain situations. But for Harinam Sankirtan, I don't see why we would do that, there's no reason. We want to be known as Hare Krishna. That's who we are. And not just some street band. <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. Um, I'm going to go to Sakshi and then I'll come back to Vishabha Prabhu. Sakshi, if you can ask a question, please. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glory to Srila Prabhupada. Uh, Maharaj, uh, my question is related to chanting. So when I try to chant, I I try to give focus on the holy name, as in I try to put attention on the holy name. But while doing that, I lack the devotional aspect. So how can I develop that prayerful mood, devotional aspect? If you put your concentration on the holy name, your devotional aspect will automatically start to arise within your mind and heart. Because the holy name is Krishna himself. And if you're connecting with Krishna through the sound vibration, that devotional aspect will automatically arise. So Prabhupada says, just try to hear. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. 
Marsh, that's another question, uh, follow-up question by Vishabha Prabhu. He says, if I understood correctly, you mentioned, Gurudev, that devotees should learn how to follow. That sounds very important. There is no culture of following the leaders in the West. That's not true. <laughs> We're following Anasuya right now. What do you mean there's no culture? <laughs> no, 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 Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Where did you get that idea from? There's, there is maybe a, a lack of 100%, but it's, well, I know what he's trying to say, and, and there's some element of value in what he's saying, that in, in Western civilization, in Western uh, societies, the individual spirit is more stronger than when it comes to the devotees who are coming from the actual culture in India. In India, there is a type of um, mood to follow superiors, to worship superiors. The undercurrent in the West is that I want to be the superior or I don't trust superiors or I can do the same thing my way in a better way. So that's there, but it's not a hundred percent. It's, you know, it's there to some degree. It's also there in India also because the Western influence is also coming what is the Western individual interest is individualism as opposed to uh, uh, working in a cooperative way to follow those who are in a position of leadership. So there's an element of truth in what he's saying, but it's not like, well, it's not there. It is there, but not as much as we find it in the Indian culture or the, the say, Vaishnav culture. It's there. I, I think, Marge, the point that you also mentioned is that, um, and like you said, there is some truth in what Vishapa Prabhu said, because I see that too. And I think, like you mentioned, it's it depends on how strong our inclination is to be the controller and not to be the follower. That's that's the uh, way we're brought up in the West, more so. Or we're brought up to follow authority, but we've seen that authority somehow falls short of being um, qualified to be authority. Therefore, we reject authority in the name of that they are not qualified. Therefore, I should establish my own authority. But you have to find that authority who is qualified to lead. It's there in the West also. It's there everywhere in the world. It's just a matter of proportion. That's all. Hope that it helped Rishabh. Yes, he said yes. Thank you. Any other questions from devotees that you would like to ask? Marsh, when you were speaking about rules and regulations, I was remembering the lecture that we heard yesterday on Bhagavatam class by Shri Prabhupada, where Shri Prabhupada was mentioning in his lecture that um, that really you know, made me think how this the rules and regulations we have, the do's and don'ts, the etiquette, everything, um, our, our servants to progress in Krishna consciousness. And I really liked how Shri Prabhupada used the word servants. So what's the question? <laughs> no, my, no, I, not a question, but more, to, you know, uh, making a comment to what you mentioned about the, you know, how these rules and regulations are important in our lives. And then, and then when you're mentioning that, I was thinking about Shri Prabhupada, how he used that 
saying that these are these are can act as our servants these rules and regulations and i really liked how she proper used the word servants that these rules and regulations the etiquette the do's and don'ts are you know are our servants to make us progress in Christian consciousness so i was just sharing that yeah there's a difference between something that assists and something is the that is the goal the rules and regulations are not the goal. They assist to get us to the goal. So therefore, in that sense, yeah, they're servants. Yeah, the, the choice of word by Prophet was the lecture was so perfect. I, I I didn't even think of that servant, you know, like the assistance that was like, wow, it was perfectly powerful for me. Any other, sorry, March. Christ said, you have a sepulcher, but it's filled with worms. He was criticizing the Pharisees in the temple that they're externally, they look very good, but internally they're, you know, something else is contaminated. So, yeah, devotion is internal. It manifests itself external. But there's those who who practice the external without really going deep in, into the internal and thinking the external. We got the example of uh, Krishna's pastimes when one cowherd boy not cowherd boy, one demon dressed up as a cowherd boy. So, and he was playing with Krishna and Balaram also. They were playing, they were having a match between Krishna's team and Balaram's team. So the demon uh, joined Krishna's team. And so all of the other boys couldn't see that this other cowherd boy was a demon. He dressed up as one of the cowherd boys who didn't come to play that day. But Krishna saw it. <laughs> Balaram didn't see it either <laughs> at first. Later on, he saw it. So Krishna's team lost, and then and the the idea was the losers would have to take the winners on their back. So this cowherd boy put Balaram on his back. And then he started going with Balaram. And then Balaram started to realize he's not a cowherd boy, he's a demon. And then he turned into his demoniac form. And that's when that was uh, Columbusura. Yeah. But, you know, nobody was able to see that this cowherd boy was actually a demon because he was, a, he was expert at the external. Yeah, maybe. So you have to be careful in God Krishna conscious movement who is actually a devotee. Doesn't mean because a person follows the rules and regulations they're a devotee. Devotee means one who the actual quali qualification of a devotee, and we were listening to Radha Swami speak last night here in Dallas. He was saying the, qual the, the qualification of a devotee is that they appreciate other devotees. They appreciate the service, they appreciate the association of other devotees. That's the qualification of a devotee. That's one of the qualifications, main one. Mm -hmm. Just because I have tea lock and I dress nicely and I look nicely doesn't mean I'm actually a devotee at heart. It may indicate something, but it's understood by consciousness and consciousness is reflected in activities. So beware of, uh, you know, Putana. <laughs> Putana looked like, you know, a mother, and she came. Everyone thought, oh, what a beautiful lady. And she's come to serve Krishna nicely. They couldn't see it, but Krishna understood who she was.
Thank you, Maraj. Yes, Sri Devi, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to share, Guru Maharaj, these exact same words were told to me by my mentor, Mother Dana Keeley, when I moved to New Orleans and I saw so many things that were very disturbing and I wrote to her. She said, do not be naive. Do not think that everyone dressed with tilak and kantimala and dhoti is a devotee. Learn to discriminate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you can. They, it's understood by their activities and by their, by their words. More by their activities, less than, but also by the words to some degree. And I think with that we need the help, as you said, Shri Like we all need mentors, you know, to really dis discriminate whether whether we've been practicing. I feel for a short time or for like eons. We all need mentors to help us in our journey. Yeah. Mark, yeah. that's a question here from Vishabadas. He said, short question if possible. For the beginners, is it important for them to stop associating with opposite sex in a friendly matter? Is that a blockage in their advancement as a subtle form of illicit sex? Just wondering. It is. It's mentioned in the Bhagavad Tom. It is. Mm -hmm. For he's, I guess he's a he's a brahmachari, so I guess he's asking from his position of brahmachari you know, to develop friendly and what we say casual relationships is a subtle form of sex desire. It's mentioned in the uh, where is it? Uh, you want to turn to that verse, six canto. First chapter, verse 13 and 14. There's two verses together, I think. Six canto. Which chapter, March? First ca chapter. First chapter. 13 and 14. This is important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 13 to 14. I got it. I'm going to share it now. There we go. Is that it, March? Six thirteen fourteen. Yeah, tapas yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the, the translation is good, but go in down to the purport. It says here, the brahmachari life of celibacy has eight uh, aspects. One should not think of women, speak about sex life, dally with women, look lustfully at women, talk intimately with women, or decide to engage in sexual intercourse. Nor should one engage for sex life or engage in sex life. One should not even think of women or look at them to say nothing of talking with them. This is first class brahmachari. Because when you when you break some of the more subtle aspects like dallying with and talking with, one thing leads to another. And pretty soon you're making plans to engage in, in activities. So this is brahmachari life. Which includes sannyas also. That doesn't apply for grihastas because grihastas associate with their wives, mm -hmm. but not in the wrong way, though. Mm -hmm. In the in the way for carrying out the affairs of of uh, grihasta ashram and for uh, practicing Krishna consciousness. Okay, is that good? Uh, um, Rishabha Prabhu. Yeah, is that all right? <laughs> Read this verse over and over again and you'll uh, get the idea. <laughs> I mean, it sounds very strict and almost impossible, but if you practice, 
you'll get a higher taste. Thank you, Marge. Any other questions from devotees? Please do let me know. You can either raise your hand, you can put it in the chat. I'm going down the list to make sure that I don't miss anyone. And uh, I did not miss anyone. Okay. If there are no questions, Marge, would you like to end with a round of chanting? Uh, yes, and I would like to uh, ask a question to you. Yes, Marge. How much time do you have before you have to leave? Marge, I can be on, but I just can't uh, be chanting because I, I'm getting emails from work, but I can still be on until, you know. Uh -huh. Okay. I yeah. just got to switch my screen, but the screen will be up. All right, because I, I was thinking of chanting a little bit longer today, so. That's fine, Marge. Yeah, and then I, I'll just go back and forth, if that's okay, Marge, please. Yeah, and devotees can stay on as much as they have time for. Okay. okay. 